that sound okay? Is that too loud? That sounds great. We've all been playing music together since we were like 14 or 15. Yeah, so we, we planted a band. We went on a big tour after graduating college. We went to different schools. Um, we did this like coast to coast tour for six weeks in September 2015. And the idea was to play a bunch of shows but also to try to find a scene where we could uh, move to. sampled like the punk basements all around the country. We tried yeah. to involve ourselves in a, the DIY scene in a lot of different areas to see if anything stuck out and this was the best one yeah. hands down. Definitely all the touring bands I think are really like impressed because it's not New York or like Chicago or like it's not even like Hadley's not even a college town like they're like it's not even Northampton or something it's kind of like very much off the beaten path of what you would consider like the music industry but at the same time it's kind of like a perfect place for this to happen i remember like when i got my car fixed the ed auto, ed's auto body it's like <laughs> this guy's lived in east hampton his entire life and he remembers when it like was when the up and coming was more of a punchline than a truth and he was really really amped that we moved here and are just excited to live here and to yeah. play and like we all love east hampton This house was kind of like a lot of people from this area who like were we all moved back like after college, so that was kind of the thing that like started it. Dan Antonio's. Yeah, the Red Cross house used to be. It was a Red Cross Association building um, for for a long time before they opened it up to tenants, probably less than ten years ago. Um, so it's, yeah, it's always been kind of passed between friends. Um, there's always been musicians who lived here. Cold Spring Hollow, for example, has had like a lot of turnover and a lot of different people who have, who have, who have lived there over time and like, it's kind of like gone up and down. You know, I think Tube Cats, for example, has been around for maybe like, maybe going on like four years now or something like that. And it's always kind of been like Van and Mike and Peter and you know, a few people turning over here and there. Cold Spring Hollow, um, it's kind of funny. Truly, like, the landlord is the house. He has a reputation, like, in Belchertown and, like, the local area of having this house that, like, no one wants to live in except for broke ass musicians. Casey took the lights for um, the show they had the other day, so it's kind of dark down here. <laughs> Um, yeah, usually everything's pushed back to that area. Mm -hmm. But so, anyways, so it's actually been a show house, you know, off and on, uh, coming and going for like decades. Like we have people who are like much older than I am um, that 
come to our house like they're playing in a band or whatever. And they're like, oh man, like I haven't been to this house in like 20 years. Like I used to live here and we used to play like shows all the time in that room. Oh, you're living in that room? Like, oh shit. And so like, I don't know, but it, it's cool how like a place becomes something just by your doing things in that place over and over and over until it becomes real. And uh, The way people like value art now is really weird because most artists work for free and don't make any money and have to work shitty jobs. Like maybe it's always been that way, but like most people who are creating art, if they have a place in the local community, are basically like scraping the bottom of everything in terms of their resources. Well, with the way that the music industry is these days, I think a lot of the established um, mainstream like venues and labels and things are just inaccessible for a lot of people. There's there's kind of like a music monopoly by a couple of like very like monopolistic and like you know capitalist like shitty venue owners, especially Eric Sewer in Northampton who owns the Iron Horse, Pearl Street, the Calvin mm -hmm. Basement, the Green Room, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, if you're a touring band, you can't, like, get paid anything at, like, Iron Horse or something, and they'll take your merch and shit. It's just good that I think he's trying to, like, control whatever the music scene is here, but he's failing because it will happen without him. So that's sort of a problem, you know, but it, it in a way it helps the DIY scene, the house show scene, but... Generally, like the way like a DIY show works is you have like on average two uh, local bands to play first and last, and like maybe two touring bands in the middle of the show, and you'll raise like you know pocket change and cigarettes to five or ten dollars from people, and that goes like you know right into the gas tank of the touring bands, and, you know, and you know, it's a labor of love. Nobody really makes much money from it. Company that wanted a survey about whether I use a radio or a TV. This came in. It came in. The, I was gonna rip it up. It was junk mail, and I opened it, and there was five dollars, <laughs> and it's now in your bucket. Wow. And I filled out the survey. I get five. <laughs> like ways to sustain yourself on tour. I feel like we were we we had a lot of hacks that I believe in while we were on tour that made it possible for us to go from basement to basement for like six weeks and still come out like in the black actually. You don't need money to make a difference in the scene, you know? You can do it and not have two dimes to rub together. You can go on a tour, you can go on a DIY tour and not have a car. We used to take like cans of beans and just, you know, scoop in, in the back seat of the car, like cans of refried beans, scoop them out on some bread, <laughs> cheese, like on the road. Um, and eat that, and we're like, great. Like, sometimes you know, it was good, sometimes it was really Yeah, good. if the bread was dry, it was no good. It really would crumble, you'd have like wet beans in your hand and crumbly bread. And we also, we would do things like make t-shirts in the car. Um, all of the shirts that we do are hand painted with like whatever designs come into the minds of the people in the back seats or driving. I mean, it's always based around a touring band. Like, I don't think we've ever had a local band show with no touring band, pretty sure. Like. So that's what ultimately makes a date, is like, this band needs help. We get hit up on Facebook, maybe someone sends us an email, or we get a text. I, you know, I think the DIY scene playing in basements, you know, creates a platform for people who wouldn't otherwise 
have it. Of course, there's like, you know, big issues of like representation and identity and um, et cetera, et cetera, that like, I think are being pushed at and are being interrogated, but like, that isn't to say that like, we should do a lot more. A venue that is for profit has a specific vision and a specific image that they want to uphold and they want that to be what they're known for. I don't see at, at big metal festivals, I don't see women on that stage and there are hundreds of metal bands that are absolutely filled with very talented female musicians. lot less you know male dominated over here which is um, you know a lot of scenes sort of suffer from that problem mm -hmm. but here I think there's been a really conscious effort to get you know like get everybody involved get everyone's voices heard and that showed up and how you know how great the spaces are well I do think it's mostly white guys booking white guys there is eternal song party that's sweet and they basically you know um, they have a mission to like book shows and to like put uh, to put like women and trans people and uh, people of color like kind of at the forefront of what they're doing. So like basically they don't like you know book your band if it's just a bunch of like white and straight dudes. I'm just sick of the white guy thing. <laughs> I'm just really sick of it. Um, you know, you, you see a lot more queer and people of color in the DIY scene than I think you see in kind of the more mainstream scenes of like punk and hardcore and metal. Yeah, I guess um, everybody definitely is welcome to come through, but it's like if you're going to be a dick, like don't come through. You want people who like need punk or need DIY or like need like music or some type of like, you know, at least the like mirage of like a counterculture who like need that in their life. You want them to be able to find it, but at the same time, like, you don't like want the party goers, you don't like want the cops. You know, cops have been cracking down pretty much across the country on, on unofficial, technically illegal kind of operations like that and like for a second I don't know I was really scared like I think we all were we were really scared that like like Western Mass is kind of a bubble but it was just like we knew people even around here people have started to notice like some fake Facebook accounts that are asking for the addresses of venues. You know, so there's also that balance too of trying to be like, okay, like we're all trusting each other to like not make dumb decisions because that would mean closing down with the DIY house. There's sort of like um, an unspoken like security culture that exists around um, DIY shows. Sometimes, you know, people will make posters, but we tend to not have super specific information on them if if they're gonna be put up publicly. Yeah. You know, it's that old thing where it's like ask a punk, like it doesn't have to be a punk, you could probably ask anyone in Western Mass and they would be able to tell you like at least one person they know who like goes to shows. I I don't one of the reasons I don't say ask a punk or anything on a on a flyer is because like are we punks? I don't know. Like I have no idea. What does punk even mean? You know, people come up to me like, oh, how do I find out about the shows? You know, I don't know. Like, you, you kind of have to, like, do a little bit of, like, legwork. The physical copies of the DIY calendar are really great. Because you can say um, at, you know, the internet, at Asbestos Farm, at 
tube cats and someone reading that on a paper in a coffee shop is gonna read that and not think twice about it and be like I don't know what that is it, you know it doesn't apply to me as someone who's interested in that will follow up the most important thing is being able to keep bringing uh, the people making the music and the people who want to listen to it together show at our house where it's like one scene like and then the next night like it's a totally different scene. Here we live in like America is such a crossroads of music and then we also are in a college area and like yeah. there's just people coming from all over the country here and we kind of like grew up with that being the background and I think that's part of the western mass music sound a little bit too that there's like all these different influences. You know how like when you hang out with people for too long you start to like have their mannerisms and talk like them. Yeah. That's how what happens with music here. Like you can really hear it in the sound when oh, we yeah. sort of ran into somebody from this area. Uh, I, I can't put my finger on it. The thing that's interesting is I hear bands like Dinosaur Junior Group and Amherst, like I hear elements of them like in like Wide Eyed, I yeah. hear that in like like my own music. But it's not like I don't know, it's not because we listen to them, I feel like it's something more than that. I feel like it's well, if they grew up in this area, like it almost makes sense that they would like go through the same kind of yeah. experiences, and that would influence it's, their music. Exactly, it's a shared experience. Like, how does um? The fact that like bands like the Pixies and Dinosaur Jr. coming out of this area like influence the fact that you guys are like trying to do something. I mean, I I've always been inspired by like the bands that are right here, but yeah. just no more than like my friends making music too. Of course. Like it's always been on the same level for me personally. If I were to pick like one of my I don't know like one biggest musical influence, it would probably be Mike. Because, Aww. I mean, Aww, shocks. Mm For a lot of people, I think making music these days isn't about making it anymore. I think it's just a way for people to get their music out there and to to share what they're doing to, to people in their own communities and also in communities across the country. It's a space to be witnessed. That's what it is for me. And because if I if I wrote songs and no one saw, saw them or heard them, then I think I'd die. I think it's really about like hearing voices and hearing music that is different and is weird and is experimenting and is saying fuck you, you know, and isn't just saying that just to say it. I think a lot of people that do it, do it because they absolutely love it. I don't, I've never made money off of a DIY show before, but that doesn't, that's like what I want to do all the time. Yeah. I, I was just thinking like, what the hell do I get out of this? Like, it's really what am I getting? Like, I can't fucking pay my student loans at all. I like, don't have, I'm not 
working up a resume. I'm not doing, like, I can't even say, if on paper I seem like a very useless human being overall, probably. <laughs> um, and, but I, I think all these people are basically just like, very committed to having this place be an open space for creative expression. In, in America, like, community is very hard to put your finger on. Like, people are very disconnected and really just don't even talk about their love for each other at all. And if they do, they sound like fucking hippies. Um, but, like, I think music in America, like, one of the things that's awesome about it is that that the love is implied and you're like being a part of music with everyone else and like there there's like a thread of connection that's not just about the music running through it if there's one thing i hope to gets does ultimately it's make it so like people who didn't know that you could do like basically just make an event happen yourself like know that you can Ready, big dong dong big boy yeah.